I gave out a ridiculous number of prostate exams. <laughs> Hunter, and this is episode 2 of my series, The Hunt, Dark Souls 3, where I give my initial impressions of Dark Souls 3 as I do my blind playthrough. As per usual, this first section will include my initial impressions of the game, and afterward I will share some of the community's thoughts. Today's area is the network test area, the High Wall of Lothric. So I have played through it before, although there were some differences between the network test and the full release version of this area. The High Wall surrounds Lothric Castle. It was guarded by the Lothric knights and foot soldiers, and their hollowed forms persist in this to this day. The place is in ruins, with corpses of dragons, tree people, worshipping hollows, and the corpses of Lothric knights are littering this area. The first section of this episode covers the, uh, the big moments and experiences I had while playing through the High Wall of Lothric, and... My my first one, I, as I've said before, I played through the network test, so I had an idea of what was going on in this level, but there were some changes, and this first one covers one of those. So, I get to the first bonfire at the high wall, and there's a watchtower in the distance to the left and to the right. So I decided to take the right path to go towards that watchtower and I make my way there and in the network test there wasn't anything significant that I can remember there just some hollows and some archers but this time one of the hollows turned abyssal and uh, that that threw me and that was a, that was a great moment just uh, now I never knew where they were throwing new abyssal hollows into the mix so that was that was great to have that thing just explode in front of me and not be expecting it so following that theme has to do with a uh, very well-known Dark Souls enemy that is making a return. So, you're walking along this corridor following the path of the left watchtower, and there's there's a, there's a dragon that lands, and it breathes fire, and it, and it looks great, and I this was in the network test, so I sort of knew what to do. I went up the staircase, waited for the fire to start to subside, then dodged all these hollows that were still alive, and I made it underneath this dragon where I could open this locked door, or to this unlocked door to a tower. And uh, I went in this tower, and in the network test, there was a Lothric Knight in there in a chest. And so there's no Lothric Knight, and the place was kind of empty, but the chest was still there, so I was like, okay, I guess maybe they're just making this a reward, and getting past the dragon is as much challenge as they want to put on you right now. So... I continued on, and I went to open the chest, and lo and behold, that chest takes a big goddamn chomp, chomp on me, as it's a, it's not a chest, it's a mimic, and, um, that was, that was a great moment, I was, I was never expecting them to throw a mimic at you on the, in the first official area, so that was, that was a huge surprise, and, um, I can't even remember what's in it ultimately, but I just love that moment where, you you got the Dark Souls back into it because for this area that I thought I had an idea of, it was my own not paying attention that sort of I paid the price for by thinking I knew the area. And that's a that's a very big Dark Souls thing. So so this this next story is a is a tale of me being an idiot with my bow. So I'm in this I'm underneath the second bonfire. I'm in the watchtower and I'm just standing out on this plank of wood where I picked up this item and I'm using this opportunity just to throw down a few arrows on the hollows in the level below and um, this one hollow comes up the stairs and I, I'm hitting him he takes he needs one more hit but I've decided to wait until he gets close and so I can just like nab him and, and look like a badass and of course he comes up to me I fire my final arrow and he dodges it it goes past him and I'm just like, oh shit. And he walks out on this plank of wood and whacks me. And I don't fall to the level below. There's a hole in the floor perfectly placed so that I actually fall to the next level, take some fall damage, and come face to face with a giant ass axe as this 
axe-wielding hollow just does me in. And it was just one of those great moments where you're doing a thing and plan to just go awry, and they've set up this level to really punish you for just being a big idiot. So that was a fun moment. So at the end of the network test, there is the Dancer of the Frigid Valley boss fight. And that's in a big cathedral past some Lothary Knights. So I make it to that point, and I'm expecting to be in a boss fight. But instead, I meet High Priestess Emma, who's the High Priestess of Lothric, and um, she's an important, she's one of the three pillars, the other one that I know so far being the Knights. So she's this big figure, and she says that the lords have left the city, they've gone back to their homes, and so you'll have to go find them there. So that was a big twist because I was expecting a boss fight. And it's that I came in contact with an NPC. So it was just sort of a reversal of expectations there. And then after I defeat the actual first boss, uh, Vort of the Boreal Valley, I realize as I'm carried down away from the high wall by uh, some bat-winged demons, which is very much um, a Dark Souls and a Demon Souls reference, that... This whole first area is a, um, it's like a reverse Anne Orlando where I'm up in the, the big city that's above everything else, and instead of working my way there, like in Dark Souls 1, I'm now starting there, but my objective to find the Lords of Cinder aren't there, so I'm being carried down. So it's a, it's a reversal on the structure of Dark Souls 1, and that, that was, a, that was a cool moment. And, um, so as I'm leaving this place. I got a few item descriptions that um, I don't exactly know how they play out yet, but it's it's definitely a few little interesting moments. And uh, the first one is that um, on a key item, the Lothric Council is described as a place that devours men. So that's that's a little, little spooky thing for the future, I guess, when we finally get to proceed on to Lothric Castle. And then um, just an interesting thing to note on the banner item description that Emma gives you to help summon the Batwing Demons to get you from the wall is that um, it says, when the high wall was built, the path to the undead settlement was blocked. So it's just interesting to know that at one point, um, the Castle Lothric wasn't closed off, but then the high wall was built later. So i um, curious to know what prompted the building of the high wall and uh, why the castle cut off connections with the outside world at that point. So now for some general story lore and atmosphere impressions. Um, same as in the network test, the area is gorgeous. Especially the landscape beyond, you can see lots of cool vistas below the city, which I'm assuming you travel to, which is exciting, just to get these little hints and try to maybe figure out what's ahead of you. Uh, this area does conjure up memories of Baltaria from Demon Souls just because it's a uh, big wall that's being defended. You just have this constant feeling that you're being trying to be kept out these defensive measures. Um, so for the story, there's a bunch of red-adorned Lothric knight corpses in a courtyard, but there's also a smaller amount of blue-clad knight corpses, and um, there's a couple blue-clad enemies that you fight. One's a knight with red eyes, a la demon souls, and the other was called the uh, winged executioner in the network test. I'm not sure if these are a few tough enemies, and I'm not sure if they're from another group associated with Lothric, or they are the remnants of an invading force, possibly. I'm not sure yet, but um, the... As far as uh, the lore, the item descriptions vary intimately call upon the world of Dark Souls 1 in particular. And so you it really feels like a continuation of that world just because there's mentions of Astora and Kareem. Heck, even in the character creation, my character's from Astora. So it just feels like it's part of that world because these item descriptions are very specific. They mention the Way of White also, and just like you get a feeling that it's this continuation of this society you remember, especially from Dark Souls 1, so it's just uh, interesting on that note. Um, you meet an NPC in the high wall called Grey Rat, 
and he's a he's locked up. He's a thief, and he wants you to take a, I believe it's a blue tear stone ring to Loretta in the Undead Settlement. I've already mentioned High Priestess Emma and the interesting reversal of being taken down from the High Wall in comparison to bringing brought up to Anne Orlando from Dark Souls 1, but, um, so it is an interesting thing that she sort of sends you away, and, um, as, a, as another little lore note, I, I also, she was apparently the uh, prince's wet nurse, so there's a, a prince of Lothric as well to keep in mind, and she was the wet nurse for him, um, in just that moment where I wasn't fighting the, uh, Dancer of the Frigid Valley, which may be the Boreal Valley now in the official version. I know some stuff changed over from Bloodborne, so I'm assuming it's going to be the Dancer of the Boreal Valley now. But, um, so that that is some interesting sort of lore just to keep in mind, and, um, maybe at some point, uh, the priestess will grow a few extra arms and start swinging swords at me. I'm not exactly sure, but the cutscene for the Dancer definitely indicated that they were in this place, so I'm assuming the dancer will appear here at a later time under a uh, different context than what I was expecting for the game based upon the network test. And now for some mechanics impressions. Um, I'm into the weapon arts and how they serve to further differentiate weapons and how you will use them. You know, I've always played Dark Souls like intimately tied to the weapon I'm using and I think this design choice only strengthens that idea. The opening area is very generous with weapons and armor, providing a great sense of choice right off the bat. It feels very accommodating to providing more options for any build, as well as the opportunity to take your build in a different direction than you may have originally thought. Um, the the Covenants, I got a, um, a um, three of his Blue Sentinels, um, covenant like badge and it's sort of like this unique ring slot and it's more like these patches it's it's kind of an interesting thing how you just can sort of slot on and off this patch and I think that that'll just change what covenant you're in so um, I'm not sure if I totally dig it yet but that's that's a difference and um, there's lots of ring slots so you have four and four ring slots and that won't be taken up by a covenant slot, so that's a pretty big deal. That gives you a lot of variety, and I haven't had my ring slot close to being filled up yet, so I assume they'll be dropping a lot more rings on me in the future. And for some level design impressions, um, the level is quite substantial, but has enough shortcuts to make the area easy to move through once you've unlocked the shortcuts. The uh, placement of bonfires felt pretty good. There are multiple ones, but the spacing was reasonable. It doesn't have the interconnectivity of Dark Souls 1 so far, where the main bonfire of the Underberg, and, for example, connected brilliantly to the rest of the level, but it didn't bother me a whole lot, and that is because there are so many routes to take. The level design feels so open and organic. It gives the player two or three ways to get to a given spot. This feels really good, and although I like the puzzle-like way Dark Souls 1 and Bloodborne levels fit together between each other, this feels good at the moment. Um, where although it's not doesn't seem like it's intimately connected into a bigger world, um, where player's choice seems a bit lacking to me is in this aspect um, because it seems like there's only one place to go from the opening area right now, and that's more linear than I was expecting the game to be. That being said, there is a it ties into the narrative, and it was a pretty great moment when I realized what was going on and this inversion from Dark Souls 1. My only concern is that this more linear opening will hamper my desire to replay the game multiple times, as taking different routes in Dark Souls 1 and even Bloodborne was a big source of enjoyment for me. The level does give me reasons to return though in the form of a couple locked doors and blocked paths. That's something that I think is critical in a game where fast travel is implemented as it is here, considering I had to fast travel to this area to begin with. So, this gives a player reasons to return to an area, and that's key to me. And uh, that has been done here very well because there is still a few locked gates that I'm looking for the key that'll let me come back. 
And rounding out this section, I have some enemy and boss design impressions. Uh, the enemies are great. There are varied types, and I think this area, as potentially someone's first formal area in a Souls game, does a good job at throwing a variety of situations at you. There are a lot of passive enemies, which is something that I always like, especially considering that they can be stirred into action by another enemy. This makes situations feel strategic and very strongly encourage the player to take in the situation and work out a plan before engaging the enemies. A large number of passive enemies also meant that I gave out a ridiculous number of prostate exams. Backstabs all day long. Um, because they're praying, I, as a small old dad joke, I came to calling prostrate exams, but uh, uh, I'm sorry about that. It's a, it's a horrible joke. Please uh, forgive me for that one. Um, there are also a fair number of encounters that are more akin to duels versus a uh, high number of enemies. And any time a game can make me taking a deep breath before I engage an enemy is great. Um, the Lothric Knights were definitely worthy combatants to go against. And um, that makes sense because lore-wise, they hold high esteem in Lothric and are described as one of the three pillars. They actively use uh, weapon arts, so they were a good test and a way to sort of showcase some of the other weapon arts. Um, coming to the boss, Boreal uh, Valley Outrider Vort, um, he's just an alright boss in my book. Um, maybe I'm being a little hard on him because I like the dancer from the network test more, and that's sort of what my expectation was, so that's something to consider that I thought something different was going to happen, and uh, this, I think he's definitely more of a beginning boss, but I even kind of liked Udix Gunder more, honestly. Um, Vort just kind of played out as a standard Dark Souls boss, circling around and stabbing him in the butt. Um, it was cool to see the Frostbite status effect in action, although um, I didn't quite get a good idea of what it does overall, but... Um, yeah, he was just kind of a standard Dark Souls boss in a lot of ways, even though the action picked up and my, my heart was beating and the music was pretty good at the end of it. Um, I'm not sure how memorable he will be in the pantheon of Soulsborne bosses. Alright, and now is our section for community impressions, and I just wanted to make a note that at this point I have actually beaten the game and I have recorded my impressions and I'm going back through and as I find time, I'm releasing these episodes. So when I do this section, this is actually after I've finished the game. So I have an impression for this area that I received, but I actually wanted to save it until the point in which I got to it in the game and in which I assume other people may have gotten to it in the game, which is a little bit later. So I'm going to save that impression and... Um, I would like to take this moment to thank people for being very positive with the uh, first episode. It was really, um, really heartening, and I was like, is this is this YouTube? Because I, I, YouTube is not a place where I go to hear people say, hey, nice work, man, like, uh, good job, like, I'm excited to see more. So that's that's really encouraging, and uh, I'm, I'm happy that it's being received well, and the episodes can only be made better by sending in your impressions. You can send, DM them, or reply to my posts on at the lore hunter on Twitter, or you can email me at thelorehunter at gmail.com. So I'd love to get more impressions. I can tell my stories and give my own thoughts, but I'd love to hear your stories and thoughts as well because it just makes it more interesting to get more opinions in here, and uh, that's really what I'm all about. So uh, although I don't have any for this week, I just wanted to uh, encourage people to send them in. It doesn't have to be anything crazy. I just want a first impression, so it's really... A few sentences, one sentence, a few paragraphs, whatever you have, just send them to me, and usually because I'm doing this based upon area, that would be great to send it that way. Alright, and that wraps things up for today. So, the High Wall of Lothric, I thought it was a good opening level design, I really enjoyed the inversion on the Dark Souls story structure, I thought uh, Vort was an okay boss, um, so... I'm excited to move on to the Undead Settlement next time. Um, as always, for this episode, uh, feedback is appreciated, and um, 
Sending in your own thoughts and impressions are appreciated even more. If you're looking for more juicy Dark Souls 3 lore content, visit darksouls3lore.blogspot.com. And I can also be found at the Lore Hunter on Twitter. And um, that's a good way to be updated as to when I'm adding things to the blog or when a new episode comes up. So, uh, as I said previously, next time I will be covering the Undead Settlement. Thanks for listening. (laughs) 